Okay, let's start. Here we go, ready to start. Okay, here we go. So, uh, just uh, there's a part time work opportunity for Apple. I think it's like being a technical service rep, and you, you can, all the details are there. Okay, so tomorrow begins the mastery. If you go to readings and homework, no. If you go to exam prep and solutions, most of you have found this already. Mastery exam folder. So the list of rules. So here are the basic rules for the functions you have to memorize. Pure memorization, okay? And then there are general rules for more complicated functions, which are combinations of the ones above. All right? So the first half of the exam, 50 points, is just short ones like these. Arctangents, cotangents, e to the x, square root of x. So, and then maybe just slight variations on those. Okay, so we'll practice those in a second. I'll have to give you a kind of a. So that's the first half of the exam. Just rapid fire, short, super simple. Okay. Then the second half of the exam. How do you close this? That. The second half of the exam comes from the bank. You will be given 10 of these. Some of you have already started working on them. You should have. You will have 10 of these. Everybody will have a different 10, but given in a fair way, okay? So everyone will have the same difficulty set of 10. <clears throat> the ones that are quotients, or we'll, we're going to do the quotient rule today. You have to use the quotient rule. You can't change it into a product and use product rule. You have to show that you know all the rules. So when there's a quotient, you've got to use quotient rule. Okay, so your second half of the uh, mastery test will be 10 of these. That's the second 50 points. To pass the mastery test, you have to get 90% or better. Mastery, that's why it's called mastery. You have to master this. 90% or better, you pass. If you don't pass, you take it again in a week. Okay, you're going to take it again a week later. And then, uh, but if you pass, if you get 90%, you automatically get 100 so if you get 90 or better, you get 100 on the first attempt, and that's worth half of the regular exams. So the, the, the master exam is worth half as much as the regular exam. Let me finish, and I'll take questions. Um, on the second attempt, you still have to get 90% or better to pass, but you're going for a lower score. Your max score now is starting at 90. So you can't get 100 anymore, so to, when you pass, or maybe 85, something like that. Okay, but, but on your second attempt, you're going for a lower score, even if you get all, everything right. So do it, pass it on the first attempt. Get it over with. So you don't have to be dealing with this in a week from now. You know, hopefully you've started studying and you're at least halfway there. And then tonight we go, we study hard. And so, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to take the mastery exam in recitation this week. So I told you it was tomorrow, so that's... That's for those who have Wednesday recitation, it's tomorrow, in recitation. If you have Friday recitation, you'll take it in, on Friday. Okay? Recitation. We will not be meeting tomorrow night or Thursday night. Okay? In recitation. Then, if you, if you don't pass it on the first attempt, we'll make arrangements for next week, because recitation will be normal again next week. Okay, now I will take questions. Did I? Yeah? No. Not. No, free response. You're writing down the derivatives. Matt. How simplified do they have to be? None. Don't do any simplification. You write down the first step and you stop. Don't do any simplification. <coughs> write down, and it says that all over the test. Okay? Write down the first step and stop. Don't simplify anything. Except if it's, you know, if it's multiplying three times four and you write 12, that's fine. But don't. Don't add fractions with a common denominator. Don't multiply through expressions of x. Just leave it as it is. Will, will we be discussing top hat layer in class? 
Uh, maybe if, if we have time, but that's a little uh, because I want to really make sure we got everything we got for the mastery. It's a little bit off the topic of the mastery, but maybe. Other questions about the mastery exam? So you'll take it in recitation. First half is going to be. Let's start. Ready? Here we go. So the first half are going to be ones like this. Sorry, this isn't. So we're going to practice. Take five minutes to work through these. This is like the first half of the mastery exam. There'll be twenty-five questions like this. Two points each. What? No. 25 like this is the first half. Then 10 from the bank on the second half. 10 from the bank on the second half. No, these are worth two points each. 25 questions, two points each, and then 10 of those ones from the bank, five points each. No natural log. That better? Okay. Any others that are? I know this is. If there's any others you can't read, just let me know. But I think they're all pretty self-explanatory. What number? Okay, for 2 and 15, do not use the chain rule. I want you to change the form of it first so you can just use basic power rule. That's the point of these. Don't use the chain rule. Change it into x to the something. Okay, and then change this into x to the something. Then use the power rule. This is these are not about chain rule. This is about do do you know your your rules of exponents so that you can make it a really easy power rule problem. That's what I'm after. Someone asked something over here. Okay. 
he would have known if 17 was sine of e. Sine of e. Sine of e. Okay, keep going. Not to, well, if you haven't memorized them yet, then yeah, but not during the master exam. Yes. Yeah. 
Subaru. <clears throat> okay, let's talk about these. So, first of all, listen carefully. If you do this, number one, if you do something like that, you will get zero points on the problem. Number one. Why? Why will you get zero on that problem? Number one. Yes, ma'am. The rate of change function is a different function than the accumulation function. They are not equal. You're finding a rate function from an accumulation function. If you set them equal, then you don't understand what's going on. The rate of change is 36 x to the eighth. So you could, if you want to, if you want to say it's equal to something, then write. You could write this. Okay, that's fine. But saying that, that the accumulation function equals the rate of change function, very bad. It means, you, it means you're, just not, you're not even thinking about what you're doing, OK? All right, what exponent for number two is the square root of x cubed? So we need to know our rules of exponents. So now I'm, not, now I'm truly doing equals, OK? I am making, I'm saying this equals what? What does this equal? x to the three halves. Well, no, that's, we're not done. That's, what it's, that's the accumulation function. Now we're ready to do the power rule. And now I'll just use uh, this notation. Still, it's the rate of change of y with respect to x is what? 3 halves x to the 1 half. There's the answer. That's the rate of change function. Now, this is valid. I'm, I'm changing the form of the accumulation function to apply the power rule, OK? So yes, square root of x cubed equals x to the 3 halves. N next step, find the rate of change function, the rate of change of y with respect to x, 3 halves x to the 1 half. OK, so 2 over x. These should be just, we're just applying the rule straight up. Any questions on 1 through 7? Are we good? Yeah, Eric. Well, the second one, where did 1 half come from? It's like, it's What's 3 halves minus 1, right? You reduce the power of the exponent by 1. So 3 halves is 1 and a half, right? Subtract 1, that's 1 half. Any questions on 1 through 7? OK, number 8. It's e squared, right? What is e squared? Is that a function of x? No, e is a number, so e squared is a number. Rate of change of a number. 0. But calculus students through the ages have said that the, the rate of change of e squared is e squared. Because you're thinking they're thinking the e to the x function. But this is a value, it's a number. x to the pi. Pi x to the pi minus one. Pi minus one. Do not write 2.14. Do not write 2.14. It's not right. It's not that, that's not right. That's not exact either. Pi is an infinite non-repeating decimal. So you don't write 3.14 here, and don't write the, x, the new exponent as 2.14. It's not the rate of change function. OK? That's self-explanatory, self-explanatory. Any questions on column 3? OK, 13 is a super simple chain rule. Rate of change of the interior times rate of change of the exterior with respect to the interior. OK, pi to the 1.5, rate of change is 0 not 1.5 pi to the 0.5. That is a number. It's a constant. Rate of change of a constant is 0. OK? Again, we, we want to write this using rules of exponents, not quotient rule and chain rule. OK? Quotient rule and chain rule is uh, what? That's like you know, using a power lift to lift up a golf ball or something. All right? it, just make it easy on yourself. This is x to the what? OK, it's negative because it's in the denominator. What's the power? 2. What's the root? 3. So it's going to be negative 2 thirds. Start by writing this as x to the minus 2 thirds.
Now the rate of change is negative two-thirds x to the negative five-thirds. Do you understand the way I approached it on the exam, on these short ones? Don't use quotient rule and chain rule to do this. Make it easier on yourself. This is x to something, x to the minus two-thirds. Easy power rule problem. Natural log of 7. 1 over 7 is the rate of change, right? No, ln of 7 is a number. Rate of change is 0. It's a constant. Sine of E. Cosine of E. No, 0. Rate of change is 0. So you've got to be on the lookout for these constants. Just because it's E to the something or natural log of something or sine of something, if, that, if, if, it's, if it's a value, if it's a constant, then the rate of change of a constant is 0. Constants don't change, so the rate of change is zero. Can I take a quick picture of this? That's in the video, but be free. Yeah. Thanks. Knock yourself out. 12. And that's just uh, arc sine is the same. You could also write it this one. It's on your list. It's one of your inverse sine functions. Did I write it? Did I do it wrong? Is that right? So that's just to memorize. It's just inverse sine, arc sine, which is also written this way sometimes. All right, are we good on the short ones? Okay, like I said, 25, the first half is 25 like this. Okay? So if you miss six of them, we don't even grade the second half. You just got 88%. They're two points each. So, and this is like free 50 points. You just memorize it, and it's like free. It's the easy, this is the easy stuff. Can we go on? Any questions? Last chance. Please. Nice and loud. Uh, on the short ones, we're, we want to use one rule to do it. Now, if it's square root of x, then you can do one over two square root of x. That's fine. But yeah, try. Yeah, no chain rule on these except for something like this. You have to. The only way to do it is chain rule. So that's super simple. Yeah, but whenever you can use a straight power rule by changing it to start, do that. Whenever you can change it into x to something, always do that. And then you have the easiest possible rule to use. Okay. Um, let's just cruise here. Okay, so remember the... Um, oh, it's because I'm not in play mode. There we go. Okay, so what is this? This says that the rate of change of f is so we're going to review the chain rule. Rate of change of f is 3.8 when x is 6.1. Everybody should be able to write a sentence what that means. What does that mean? 3.8 is the rate of change of f when x is 6.1. What does that mean? Everyone take a minute and explain what that means. If there's one thing I want you to get out of the course, or maybe the, uh, three things. This would be one of three things I would want you, everyone to get out of the course when they leave. That you can explain what that number 3.8 means. Go. Everyone to no talking. To, everyone think to yourself. See if you can do it yourself. See if you can do it yourself. No talking. Have your response? Okay, now you can talk. Go.
lot of the afternoon, so maybe uh, we'll make an announcement that if anybody wants to... Can you come remind me at the end again? Yeah. Yeah, sure. come, come at like 10, so, right when I'm wrapping up. That way, because we didn't get a chance to go over their quiz, and also I can ask them. Okay. Yeah. Is this your student? Do you have Hayden? No. That's Roy? Yeah. I can give it to Roy. You can? We have, yeah, well, well, we, we have the same office. office. Yeah. Okay, how'd you do? This is what it means. There's other ways to say it, but this is the essence of it. If, if you get a tiny change in X around 6.1, the output will change 3.8 times as much as whatever little change in X you picked. Okay, so that, that's crucial. This is what rate of change is. Given a small change in X around 6.1, Y will change 3.8 times as much as that change in X. Delta Y equals K delta X. Okay, but, but now that it's the derivative at 6.1, that delta X has to be very small. Okay? So if, if, you, didn't, if you didn't think of this or didn't write this down, today's the day that you're going to learn it and never forget it. That's what rate of change means that the output changes that much times as much as the input changes for a small change in x around the given x value. Okay, so we've got this function g of f of x. I'm going to go through this again. This is really important because this is what you want to be thinking about when you're executing the chain rule. Okay, what happens first? x changes a little bit. How much does f change? when x changes a little bit, if the rate of change of f with respect to x is 5. 5 times as much. That's what we just said. So this is x changes a little bit, so then f, the output of the f function, will change 5 times as much if the rate of change is 5. Okay, well now that gives us a change in the input of g, right? That, that change in f is how much the input of g changes. How much will the output of g change? if its rate is 3. 3 times as much as whatever the change in f was, or the change in, it, in its input. Okay, so the output of f changed a little bit, so the input to g changed a little bit. The input to g changed this much, and now the output of g will change 3 times as much as that. So given a little change of x, how much does the output of g of f of x change? By what multiplier? 5 times 3. 15. 15. So the output, when, when you change x by a little bit, the output of g of f of x changes by 5 times 3 as much. And that, that builds the, this builds the idea of the chain rule. So what do you ask? Okay, so did you understand the previous slide about what 3.8 meant? For a little change in input, if the rate of change is 3.8, then the output changes 3.8 times as much. So we're gonna do, that's all we're doing. So now just look at f of x. I'm going to change x by a little bit. The rate of change is 5. So how much does f change? 5 times as much as the change in x. That's just like the previous screen. Now, so, but if, if that, now that's a change in F. That's a change to the input of G. Yeah. And the rate of change of G is 3. Yeah. So, the, so then when F changes that much, G of F will change three times as much as that. So, how does X equal 6.1? That's the current X value. That's just where we're at. So, so we're, we're like, we have a little change in X near X equals 6. Does that make sense? Okay, so then if, so looking at the whole function as a whole, then a little change of x is going to result in a 15 times, the output will change 15 times as much because it'll be times 5 and then times 3. And that forms the basis of the chain rule. No, the whole thing is 15. This is our 3, 
and this is 5. G changes 5 times as much as whatever that change of that is. Yeah. So the whole, the whole thing is 15. This is 5 times 3. Does it make sense? So this is where the chain rule comes from. So the rate of change of the composite with respect to x is going to be first, think of x changing a little bit. The interior function changes that many times as much as x. Okay, But then the interior function has a change. And so then you have to multiply by the rate of change of the exterior with respect to the interior function. And then this form is the same thing. It means the exact same thing. Okay, so uh, this is the order I want to teach you in, that you start in the, working from the inside out, because we'll see later. When you have multi-layer chain rule, I think this, this approach really helps. So on the easy ones, and you, the orders, you kind of do it either way. But on, when, you, when you have the multi-layer chain rules, like three or four, and you have those on, in the test bank, I think working it from the inside out is really helpful because you know exactly where to start and then you know exactly where to finish. There's no, there's no question about when to start and when, where to start and where you're going to be done. If you go from the outside in, sometimes students feel like, I don't know when, when to stop. I don't know when my last step is. So I think going from the inside out alleviates that. Okay. All right, so let's, some quick chain roll. Go, just five minutes. I want to do some harder ones. Quick chain roll. Here we go. So let, let me just do the first one with this kind of approach that I'm t telling you. So if so, then this is like f. So let's change this here. Let's call this. So then this is like f, and then what is g? Well, cosine, all right? So if x changes a little bit, how much does f change? How many times as much? 1 over x times as much, right? The rate of change of f with respect to x. And then when f changes a little bit, how much does g change with respect to f changing? Negative sine of that. So rate of change of f, rate of change of the interior with respect to x times the rate of change of the exterior with respect to f, as in Frank. You leave that interior function as it is, negative sine of ln of x. Okay, try the rest. Go.
think of it, so think of it as one function as an interior function and then one function as an exterior function. So what's the interior function? Right, so we're going to do that one with respect to x first. Yep. Nope, just the rate of change of the interior with respect to x. Yeah, but this is what you wrote so far is not right. It's the rate of change of the interior function with respect to x. So I'm not sure why you're squaring it. We haven't talked about the exterior function yet. The first, remember the first part of it is the rate of change of the interior with respect to x. Then times the rate of change of the exterior with respect to the interior. Okay, I put the second one up there. How'd you do? Really? No, I got it right. Okay. Don't be so hard on yourself. Does it make sense? See how that follows it? Same as what? Yeah, it's a function of x. Yeah, right. Tan is the f, and then seven to the x is g. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna I'm put one up.
Did you get this one? Why not? So it's constant multiple rule, first of all. It's going to be six times the rate of change. Okay, so what's the interior function? 7 to the tan x. What's your f and what's your g? So the f is going to be tan x. Right. And the g is going to be 7. 7 to the, sum, seven to the x. So what does this? What does the chain rule say? Rate of change of the interior secant squared. Okay, well that's just the rule. You just memorize it. Times the rate of change of seven with respect to tan x, which is seven to the tan x on the seven. If I there a question for you, if I wrote down the actual uh, uh, one half x and minus one half, perfectly fine. No. Okay, so the point is on the last one, when you have some, some complicated function within another one, well, when you get to the rate of change of 6 times 7 to the tan x, it's the exact same rate of change as what you did when you had it by itself. So when it's incorporated into a more complicated function, it doesn't change what its rate of change is. So we get to the rate of change of 6 times 7 to the tan x. Well, we already did that. Here's the rate of change of 6 times 7 to the tan x. Get it? It's not going to change it because it's embedded in a more complicated function. The rate of change of 6 times 7 to the tan x is the same, whether it's standing by itself or it's tucked inside something else. OK, any questions on these examples? Are we having some success? Are we getting, are we getting better? OK, question. The last one kind of got me. Okay. Especially that last section. Okay, and so then also I I'm I use both, so I'll get to you in a second. For the square root function, you can you can choose. It doesn't matter. Either way is fine. You can do one over two radical x. Okay, if you're still working, that's great, just whisper. If you're still working, that's great, just whisper. Just whisper. Okay, so um, you can do 1 over 2 radical x. I used that here. And then in this one, I used 1 half to the negative 1 half. Either is fine. And, and you can always use one, always use the other. You can do it sometimes. doesn't matter. So you pull credit for both. Okay, so Eric, what was your question? Here? 
So I'm doing that rate of change of the interior here. That's the first parentheses. Times the rate of change of the exterior, which is square root. So it's going to be 1 half to the minus 1 half, leaving the inside as it is. Do you follow it now? OK. Yeah, Adam. So is that actual log times negative all constant? It's all constant, because x, x is, the, is the input variable. B is something else. So if we're if we're taking the derivative with respect to x, then B is constant. B so yeah, B is not x. So if it's not x, then this is a constant relative to B, relative to x. Other questions on this screen? Ready to go on? Yeah. It's the rule for 7 to the x. How would you do 7 to the x? 7 to the x, its rate of change would be 7 to the x, ln of 7. That's the rule for an exponential function. Yeah, you're memorizing the exponential rule, right. Other questions? Going on. All right. So remember with, with products, is the rate of change of a product the product of the rates of change. Who's, who did their homework over the weekend? No, it's not. We, If you did your homework, you watched the remaining video that I posted, and I showed you the product rule. Okay. Instead, it's the rate of change of the first times the second as it is, plus the rate of change of the second times the first as it is. So what about with quotients? Is the rate of change of a quotient the quotient of the rates of change? Wouldn't it be nice? No, it's not. So let's talk about the quotient rule, OK? The quotient rule. So let's, let's figure out the quotient rule by changing this one time. We'll change our, our arbitrary quotient, f of x over g of x, change it into a product, and apply the product rule. And then that will we can derive the quotient rule that way. So how do we change f of x over g of x into a quotient? How do we change that into, uh, sorry, into a product? How can we change that to something that's equal, that's a multiplication? We know this, right? How can you make a, this? yes, please tell me. Um, you, uh, yeah, f time, right, right. That's the same as f times g all to the negative 1 power. So now I want you to apply the, the product rule to that. So can you do the product rule on this right here? See if you can do it. Go. I'll give you a hint. Within the product rule, somewhere you're going to have to use the chain rule. Okay, that's your hint. Within that product rule, you're going to have to use the chain rule somewhere. That's what the product rule is. The first times the derivative of the second 
plus the second times the derivative of the first. When you do that, for this one, you're going to need chain rule somewhere. You're going to need chain rule. Okay, so what, so let's follow it. What's the first? What's the first? F of x. What's the derivative of the second? So that's where our chain rule comes in. So we do the rate of change of the interior times the rate of change of the exterior with respect to the interior. So what's the rate of change of that in the going to be power rule, right? Negative 1 times to the negative 2. Plus <coughs> the second times the derivative of the first. What's the second? not g. g of x to the negative 1 is the second. <coughs> Times the derivative of the first. F positive. Yeah. Rate of change of f. That should have been your first step using the product rule on this. So when you get to the rate of change of the second, right here, it is chain rule. Because you have g plugged into something to the negative 1. So that you should follow that, or you should come up with it, and if you didn't, you should follow, that should make sense. First times the derivative of the second plus second times the derivative of the first. Any questions on that? Okay, so here's that written with a d dx form, and then, or here, so okay, so there's, that's more like what we did. And then just with a little bit of algebra, we're not going to take the time because we want to do practice problems, but with a little, little bit of rearranging, we get this. Okay? So just a little bit of rearranging, a couple steps, we get this. Okay? And so there it is again in the R form, R, our rate of change form. I shouldn't do that. And then here's the pri using the prime form. Okay, so you got three. That's basically the same things I just wrote. So this. What does that say? It's the the denominator times the derivative of the numerator minus. The numerator times the derivative of the denominator over the derivative denominator squared. Yeah. Yeah, we're going to do that. Okay, so here's a little, little, uh, little song you can sing to yourself to help you. Low d high minus high d low over low squared. So low meaning so low meaning denominator, high meaning numerator. Low d high minus high d low over low squared. Okay, and so all but then all you really need to memorize to get this right is just the very first part. If you can get just that, then you then the rest falls into place. Low d high minus. Just remember, low d high minus. Then it has to be high d low and then over low squared. So low d high minus. Product rule is, is hard to mess up because you can switch the order of addition, you can switch the order of multiplication, and there's you know, four or eight ways to write it or something, okay? This, you, this makes a difference if you switch order. You gotta get this, when you switch the order and subtraction, you get something different, so you get the opposite. So you need to get, you need to do low d high minus to start. Got to get that starting right, and then the rest you'll have. Low d high minus high d low over low squared. Can you explain that? 
Low is referring to the, the function in the denominator. High, low, right? High is referring to the function in the numerator. So low would just be the function in the denominator. D high would be the derivative of the function in the numerator. And then minus high D low would be the numerator. So here's low D high minus high D low over low squared. Is that better? Is it, are you following that now? So low just means the denominator. D high, derivative of the numerator, etc. Practice. No, we're not doing that. Okay, so here we go. So this is good practice, the qu quotient rule. So the rate of change of tan x is secant squared. Let's prove it, okay? So first of all, tan is sine over cosine, and you'll need to know that sine squared plus cosine squared equals 1. And you know, of course, you know that the rate of change of cosine is minus sine. So we want to find the rate of change of We want to prove that it's secant squared. Knowing that, what is tangent? Sine over cosine. Sine over cosine is what kind of structure? So we're always on these harder problems. We're going to always ask, identify the structure first. What is the structure of sine over cosine? What is that? Quotient. Go. Quotient rule. Go. And then you're going to so you're proving that, that the rate of change of tan is secant squared. So we're using the quotient rule on sine over cosine to show that the rate of change of tan x is secant squared. What's low? What's D high? Sine x of sine. That's how you start. There's low D high. There's low D high. That's the start of the quotient rule. Keep going. That's low D high right there. Yeah, low D high. <laughs> Give you a tip. Remember your trig? Look at the numerator. Both sine squared, both sine squared. What's D low? What's D low? Derivative of cosine. Negative sine. D low squared. Thank you. 
Negative sine x plus sine x. Negative, it's minus sine x times negative sine x. So this is negative sine x squared. Sine squared x. And, but you're subtracting it, so it's adding. Cosine squared plus sine squared equals? And what is, what is secant? Secant is 1 over cosine. Got it. So 1 over cosine squared is secant squared. Did you see what happened? Does that make sense? So that's an easy, that's an easy quotient rule. Easy quotient rule that shows that the derivative of tangent x is secant squared. Any questions? Okay. Here we go. The harder ones. Always ask, what's the structure? What's the structure of the function? So what's the structure of this? Is it a something to a, uh, is it chain rule? Is it something to a power? Is it a product? Is it a quotient? It's a quotient. So it's going to be, we're going to use the quotient rule to do it. But now when you get to the rate d high and d low, you're applying other rules too. You're applying chain rule. When you get to d high, d low, you're applying addition and subtraction, all these different things. Okay? So it's low d high, right? Low d high. So here we go. Low. There's low. D high. D high is what's the structure of d high? log, but it's chain rule, right? Because it's 4x plugged into log base 2. So we start with rate of change of the interior times rate of change of log base 2 with respect to 4x, which is 1 over 4x ln of 2. So there's d high. There's low d high right there. That's low d high minus high d low. There's high. Okay, d low. What's that? Need more room. So minus. High times d low. So d low, the structure is subtraction. So we're going to do rate of change of that minus rate of change of that. Rate of change of that is chain rule. Interior function, radical x. So we're going to have 1 over 2 square root of x times rate of change of 3 to the something, which is 3 to the something times ln of 3 minus rate of change of cosecant is negative cosecant cotangent. Do you see what just happened? So remember, look, think structure, low d high minus high d low. But we had chain rule when we got to those derivatives. We have chain rule when we get to those derivatives. Apply it like we did before. Questions in the numerator. All over. Easy, right? Just write down the denominator and square it. Done. Question.
What's what's the rule for three to the x? What's the rule for three to the x? What's the rate of change of three to the x? Three to the x times l and a three times l and a three. That's why I multiply by l and a three. But now it's chain rule, so we're going to start with what? The rate of change of the interior times three to the something, whatever. Wow. Yeah. See? Questions on this one? Yeah. Looks like CG. Sorry. No worries. Okay, any other questions? Next one. Ready for the next one? Go. Structure, overall structure. Quotient. You can apply quotient rule. Okay, here's the warning. Oh yeah, it's double chain rule. Let's see, is Two layers, right? So the initial interior is what? 3x, first of all. And then the next layer is negative sign. And then the last layer is e to the. Sign. Forget about the E. Now you're doing sign. So what's the rate of change of negative sign? No. Negative cosine. Negative cosine of the inside as it is. Now times. That's right. Leave the inside as it is. Two things. 
Okay, so sometimes on these harder ones it helps to do it. Recognize the overall structure, which is going to be our quotient rule. But then write out, so now look at, so do d high, right? So do d high by itself, which is what we're calling f prime, okay? Which is cosine of cosine x times minus, so that's reversed how we've been doing it. So I've been showing you to do, so it'd be minus sine x first times cosine of cosine x. All right, and then d low would be negative 3. So this is two layer chain rule here. The, when you do the derivative of the low, two layers. First negative 3, well the negative goes with the, sorry. It'd be 3 first times negative cosine of 3x, then times e to the negative sine 3x. And then just, now you got everything, just plug it all into the, to the quotient rule. Low d high minus high d low over low squared. Okay. Does anybody have a MacBook Power Cord? Yes. A newer, newer type one? Yes. Oh, it doesn't let me do it. Quick. All right. So well, so we'll just go on to the next one. Uh, Okay, write them down, at least get started, okay? At least get started, go. It's not quotient rule times quotient rule. It's not quotient rule times quotient rule. <laughs> overall structure of function G. The overall structure of function G. A product. I'm going to call the first P and the second Q. So let's just write out in general what will it be. So the derivative of G with respect to X will be the first <coughs> times the derivative of the second plus the second times the derivative of the first. So writing down P and writing down Q in the product rule, that the first and the second, that should, that's no problem. You just copy it down. So what about when we get to the rate of change of Q within the product rule here? The rate of change of Q. Overall structure. Overall structure. Rate of change of Q. Quotient rule. Okay? So you're going to do the quotient rule. Pretend Q is its own problem. Do the quotient rule, and that's going to go here in the product rule. What about the rate of change of P? Quotient rule. 
So it's the first times the rate of change of the second, which is quotient rule, plus the second times the rate of change of the first, which is quotient rule. Within the quotient rule, you will have chain rule. When you get to the rate of d high and d low, you'll be using chain rule. Yeah. yeah, that's the product rule. Okay, I will work these two out and put it on the end of today's class video, the answers to these. Okay, tomorrow, Wednesday recitation, people, you're taking mastery, attempt one. Okay, so this is where we left off class. We saw that the overall structure of this function was a product, so we're going to have the product rule. First times the rate of change of the second, plus second times the rate of change of the first. But when we get to the rate of change of the second, that's the qx function, that's going to be quotient rule. So let's do that to up here. So the quotient rule to do the derivative of q, or the rate of change of q. So here we go. So I'll do that here. It's going to equal low d high will be chain rule 4 e to the 4x minus high d low. Well d low, we actually did this earlier in class. We did this chain rule problem earlier in class, so it's not going to be any different. It's going to be it's going to be our one over two derivative of the inside times the rate of derivative of the this thing squared, which would be two times this to the first power. So there is. Uh, low d high minus high d low all over low squared which would be this thing squared squared okay so that is the rate of change of the second so now we're going to need the rate of change of the first so that's derivative of p with respect to x Again, low d high, so it's going to be low d high will be chain rule. And this is actually another one we did earlier in class. So it's not going to be different. The rate of change is going to be 1 over x times negative sine of natural log of x minus high d low. I is going to be cosine of ln of x times d low log with sine plugged in. So we're going to start with times cosine x times 1 over sine x times ln of 5. It's the numerator all over low squared. Okay, and then you would just, you've got all four parts. Uh, quotient or product rule is first times the rate of change of the second. So there's the first, you would just rewrite that and put it here times the derivative of the second. We did that up here. So you take this whole thing right here, and you'd put it in here, substitute it for that. Plus the second, that's that function right there, times the derivative of the first, which is what we figured out here. And so your, your answer is going to be this expression right here with all four things plugged in. Number one, number two, number three, plugged in there, and number four, 
plugged in there. And that would be the answer. So I'm not going to take time to write all that out, okay? But on the mastery exam, you would have to, okay? Then the last example we had in class I want to show you was this one. Now this is a multi-layer chain rule problem. You have, what you have here is, you have this expression here, starting with x to the fifth, and that's plugged into natural log, and that's plugged into arc sine. So we're going to start from the inside out, and we're going to start with the rate of change of the interior function. So let's see if I can fit it all in one line here. So we're going to start with the rate of change of this with respect to x, which will be 5x to the fourth plus 6 times the rate of change of that, which is chain rule, which is going to be secant squared times uh, exponential would be, you just first of all rewrite it, times ln of 7. That's the rate of change of the interior function. Now we do the rate of change of this next layer with respect to the interior function. So it's going to be 1 over 1 over this. So 1 over this thing. x to the fifth plus 6 times 7 tangent 10x minus ln 10 times b to the negative one-fourth. Okay, and then it's going to be times the rate of change of arc sine with respect to all of this. So our arc sine formula is 1 over 1 minus the argument squared, this thing squared. And we'll be done. So it's going to be, I'm going to do it down here, so 1 over the square root of 1 minus what we're taking the arc sine of squared. So it's going to be natural log x to the fifth plus 6 times 7 to the tangent x minus ln of 10 b to the negative 1 fourth. So here's our derivative of arc sine, 1 over 1 minus the, the argument squared. The argument is everything we're plugging into arc sine. So that follows the 1 over square root of 1 minus x squared formula for the derivative of arc sine. So this is a multi-layer chain rule here. Derivative of the interior with respect to x times the derivative of natural log with respect to that that right there, times the derivative of arc sine with respect to everything plugged in. And you know you're done because the, the structure of this is arc sine, and that's the, so that's the last thing you'll do, is the derivative of arc sine, because that's the overall structure of the J function. Okay, <clears throat> good luck. Study hard for the mastery. Pass it on the first attempt.